when Beckenreese took on the Wild Deserts project, I don't think that they imagined it was going to be as tough and as dry and as hard as it was. A lot of people often talk about the Australian desert being a huge shock for them with those huge open vast landscapes. But that was the bit that interested me the most, that you couldn't see a tree on the horizon. Um, I found that fascinating. What really makes me passionate about uh, spending time in the desert is the extremes. The boom and the bust. It's the land of drought and, and flooding rains, uh, literally. But it's a long way from anywhere. You a little bit frustrated, Zaki? We're nearly home. Some months we will travel a 300 kilometre round trip to go to playgroup. I know, it's been a long drive. We're nearly home. It's really hard work. And there have been moments where I've told Reese that I'm not sure if we can keep going. But working on a project like this, I feel like I'm doing something. There are species that have now gone extinct on our watch, and we need to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Pretty lucky having one of these near our house, aren't we? He's a bit nice. He's a bit nice. He's, they're actually a very rare creature. But they're... More mammals have died out in Australia over the last 200 years than anywhere else in the world. It is extinction central. So it's so vital that we do something about it because we're custodians of this extraordinary nature that is nowhere else. It's incredibly tough working and living out there. More library books. Yay! That'll keep you going for a while. How do you fit in having two babies in a very remote part of the world and you've got this massive project that you're trying to keep ticking along? You want your groceries? Would you like your apples? They're in the middle of nowhere out here. And it's heavy. Everything is, is made more challenging due to the remoteness of, of this location. The tyranny of distance means that you have got to be onto it. Because if you run out of something, you can't pop somewhere and get it. Well, you can, but it's going to take you 10 hours. We are in Sturt National Park right on the edge of the Streslecki Desert. Beck and Reese have lived five years of their life now up here, living and breathing the Wild Deserts project. That's what we've got. What do you reckon, Zach? We've got a little bandicoot, Catherine. It's a really daunting and high-stakes project. What we want to do is create a safe haven to reintroduce locally extinct mammals back into this area. That's the goal, that's, that's, that's the vision. Who have we got, Catherine? Barns. Oh, we've had barns before. It's a boy. These desert ecosystems have been changed, perhaps beyond all recognition. Just wondering if you wanted me to follow you up this way? Yeah, Reese will be out here shortly and he can give us a hand on this line. We've lost so many species from this desert that helped it to function. The species are a bit larger than a, a mouse, but smaller than a wallaby. <laughs> We need these animals back in this desert because they dig huge burrows, so they're turning over all of that soil, restoring the desert. Exciting, isn't it? We're going to bring this desert back to life in its full glory, allowing people to appreciate and understand what it used to be. Before white settlement in this area, the landscape would have been completely different. The place would have been just sort of like exploding with life. 
small animal like bilbies or goat we call them in our language. Um, yeah, they would have been a delicacy too, yeah. But there would have been heaps of them, yeah. Since European colonisation, the changes that this area has seen have been enormous. In the late 1800s, pastoralists moved into this corner of the country looking for areas to, to make their living. You had a lot of overgrazing in the early days when people weren't aware of the carrying capacity of the land. Just that decline in land condition has really been catastrophic for a lot of our native animals. In Australia, we've lost about 100 native species, 34 mammal species, and a lot of that damage occurred in the sort of 1800s and 1900s. Rabbits, more than anything, have changed this landscape. Just decimated everything in their path. And there's these historical accounts of these um, early sheep stations along the Streslecky Track and Streslecky Creek where they abandoned their leases because of the changes that the rabbits made in a, in a couple short years. Shortly after the rabbits came the cats and foxes. Foxes and cats pretty much wiped out those smaller mammals in the, in the area up there. Beck and Reese, like all conservationists, want to try to reverse what's been happening. Conservation has been part of my childhood. I was surrounded by animals and appreciating nature and understanding it. I grew up in the UK and when I was 12, my dad took a position as director of Chester Zoo and um, that really started my uh, experience of being very close to conservation. She and her brothers and sisters were able to come into the zoo and just get behind the scenes and do things that no other children would be able to do. They helped wash the elephants, they cleaned out giraffes, they saw animals being born, they fed the snakes. Chris West says Adelaide Zoo needs to be less of a Noah's Ark, containing a bit of everything. He says when it comes to modern day zoos, less is often more. I was offered the job of chief executive of Adelaide Zoo. So the family moved and it was a, a huge adventure and, and a whole new experience of becoming Australian. I think my childhood experiences made me want to work with animals. So I went down a zoology pathway. I did my PhD on rock wallabies in their APY lands, just below Alice Springs, um, looking at reintroduction into a fenced reserve. Rock wallabies are sort of like the, the Spider-Man of the, the Rocky Hills. You predict that they're going to bounce in a nice leisurely fashion and suddenly they go straight up the vertical cliff that's next to you and they're off and away. I swapped green, lush, grey and rainy England for red, dust, dry, outback Australia. But to me, I felt like I was at home actually, um, even though I was very far from home. I started life on our family's farm in the mid-north of South Australia. Both my parents are really strongly involved in conservation. As kids, my sister and I used to spend a lot of time out on scientific surveys with my parents. When I graduated from uni, I, I was able to um, take a job in the South Australian outback. I started becoming uh, intrigued with water birds uh, when I was living in the desert at, at Roxby Downs. But just how do the birds know when it's rained inland? It's a question ecologist Reese Pedler is trying to answer. These birds somehow are able to sense the barometric pressure change or hear the distant thunder, and they fly hundreds of kilometres uh, overnight. Beck 
applied for a job with me as a research uh, assistant or research officer and worked up at Roxby at Arrow Recovery for a few years and that's where she met Reese. He said, oh, I've got a spare room in my house. You can move in, find somewhere to rent. I thought, geez, this guy's really generous. That's very kind of him. And so I moved in and then a month later, I just moved rooms and went over and moved out. We heard that the Wild Deserts project was on the cards and so we decided to sell ourselves as a double act. Wild Deserts is a partnership between the University of New South Wales, Ecological Horizons and the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service. Fort Grey was the old pastoral homestead that used to be here, up in the Sturt National Park, and now it's, it's the Wild Deserts headquarters. We needed two people to run the show, and they had to be an ecologist and a project coordinator. Richard brought us out to Fort Grey for a couple of days just to show us around. No one had been living in the place for 12 months and out here things become very dusty very quickly and we came into the homestead and I remember walking in here and thinking, hmm, am I going to be able to live here? So the project started in 2016, fencing this 50 kilometre fence network. These fences are a special design. They're two metres high, they have netting that flops over the top to stop the cats climbing and getting in. We have these two large areas, each around 20 square kilometres, and we call them exclosures rather than enclosures because we're trying to keep cats and foxes and rabbits out to create an environment that's safe for some of these small mammals. And we have a list of seven species to try and return to this area. We're talking about bilbies, betongs, crestail mulgaras, stick nest rats, western quolls, golden bandicoots, and shark bay bandicoots. The next step was to eradicate all the cats and foxes and rabbits from inside both exclosures. Rabbits, let's find rabbits, come on. Find them, this way, this way, come on, find them. Reese and Peg dealt with every live rabbit. Oh, Peg dog. Because we couldn't afford to have a single rabbit in there. Good dog, Pegsy. We made a, made a cake in the shape of a rabbit for the moment when we said, yep, we've got them feral free, which is mm. a pretty big milestone in the project. By 2018, we'd built these fences and we were absolutely raring to go. But the drought started at the end of 2017 and it really gripped the area and we thought it would never end. suddenly just had a spanner shoved right in the middle of it and everything ground to a halt. There was nothing to eat, so we couldn't actually sort of think about bringing the animals in. Basically, the place was a dust bowl. Just cleaning a couple of years' worth of dust storms out of this gutter. It just got progressively drier and drier and drier until it looks like we were almost living on Mars. There were just red sand dunes with very little vegetation. We started to watch the really old, long-lived trees die and it's an incredible um, sense of feeling totally helpless because it's a climatic event that's completely out of your control. The monumental cloud travelled from Broken Hill to Dubbo, enveloping entire towns, leaving them in complete darkness. Dust storms were really frequent and being outside in those conditions, it's just impossible to get anything done. You have to retreat back to the house and, and then watch um, everything just being obliterated. Watching everything just slowly die around you, the birds in the garden, the kangaroos, um, it got pretty hard. It was a real kick in the teeth to have the whole project thrown off course and those milestones completely evaporate because the drought conditions made it impossible to safely reintroduce um, any animal species into those exclosures. It was just over a year into the project that I fell pregnant.
when we first brought Isla back to Fort Grey as a little baby, I did have that overwhelming feeling of, oh my goodness, what are we doing with such a small child in such a remote place? We had this heat wave for a, a few weeks where it was in the 40s every day. We're totally off grid with power. The generator had gone kaput and there I was at 1am out there in my jocks trying to fix this diesel generator to get the air conditioning back on for the house. You have to learn very quickly to make do, to improvise, and YouTube is your friend. You look up all the how-to videos you can. At the end of 2019, we'd had three years in a row of very, very dry times. Just give that a couple of good taps and it'll come off easy as that. We sat down and said, look, I, if it doesn't rain next year, I'm not sure we we're going to be able to stay on because um, we couldn't progress with any of the project because it was so dry and I think that put a, a lot of a toll on us. Our wettest day in five years. When the drought broke in March 2020, we got these really soaking rains and it was just wonderful. Both of them sort of ran out in the rain and jumped around in puddles. I get fun. It was the first time that Isla had really seen rain like that and we ran her out into it to experience it and she started crying because I think it was a bit too much for her. Can you hear the frogs? Careful. But for us, it was a pretty, I guess, direction-changing event that day. As soon as you added the rain, the place would take off. There'd be lots of food. It wouldn't take long. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. That was a green light for us to bring back the animals. The first 10 bilbies came from Taronga Western Plains Zoo over in Dubbo. Suddenly, there was a plane landing on the airstrip with animals in it, and we were going to take them out and go and release them into wild deserts. And I also felt a bit like a worried mother, you know? Was it going to be good enough for them? Were they going to survive? I had a sort of stress and nervous tummy. Just to see the bilbies, we call them Gertie, being released back onto this land. Uh, it was very magical, it took my breath away. Um, and it, for me, it means that the land's healing itself. It was a very special moment for me. Isla was nearly two when we uh, reintroduced bilbies to wild deserts and she was there to watch the first bilbies hop out of the bag onto the red sand and the bilby hopped out of the bag and this little tiny child's voice said, Bilby! Bilby! <laughs> I remember looking across at Reese and um, it was a moment for a high five because we'd finally hit that goal which had seemed so far away for, for so long. When we first released them, we put radio transmitters on them and we can follow them to their survival, but that's only a short-term thing. And then we take the transmitters off. I'm gonna get that Yali go. The first three animals to be reintroduced were the greater bilby, uh, the crest-tailed Mulgara, and the shark bay bandicoots. Now that they've got the ability to actually undertake the work on the ground, um, they're not walking, they're running. There was the perfect conditions for them to thrive. Suddenly you'd walk out onto these verdant dunes and then you'd see pockmarked every few metres an increasing number of little bilby diggings. 
they use burrows and they dig for their food. So they are turning over the soil and that helps all the nutrients to flow, helps water to collect in those foraging pits and seeds. And so you create a healthier ecosystem by having those digging animals around. Bilbies just seem to breed like rabbits. You know, if you've got plenty of food there for them, they'll go for it. A whole lot of the females had little pinkies, that's the, the pouch young that they have, and suddenly we had the next generation of bilbies and, and the first wild deserts bilbies, which was unimaginably exciting. I like to think they're my grandchildren because I was, I was released the first one. We had a very busy year when I was pregnant the second time. But it meant that the pregnancy flew by and I wasn't counting the weeks or worrying about anything. Often when we're doing very early morning starts, I'll actually take um, young Zach with me, which is great experience for him sometimes quite stressful for me. Look, see, Zaggy. You see, she's got some teats, so she's had some babies, and they've got big now, and she's probably let them go, and they're on their own. That's a really good sign. We've just been trapping this week and caught all three species, and all of them are breeding. They're all healthy. They've put on weight. One of the original release yeah. ones. No, it was our first ever um, female bandicoot recruit. Yeah. Um, we caught her the other day. She was 190 grams. Okay. Yeah. That's a good size. Trapping for me feels a bit like Christmas because you approach each trap and you don't know quite what you're going to get. It's like a, a present or, or a, it's a real reward. 64.9. We can do weights and measure their head and their feet, and that gives us a really good idea of their body condition uh, and whether they're finding enough food. One thing we've been really keen to do since arriving here is to engage with the local community and especially our neighbours and their kids. So I actually got five of the shark bay bandicoots, which is pretty cool, wow. and one of the females actually had little pouch young that long, so wow, that was male and fantastic. female. With the Wild Deserts Project coming to the national parks, I think there was a little bit of reservation at first. Wow, good job. But from us, I think we were genuinely excited that there was some activity happening. Do you remember the second Mulga, the first Mulga I recorded? Do you remember that was called? We sort of got to be part of the project as it was as it was building. So, you know, unloading fencing materials or, you know, the first trappings that we did to sort of, before they even had the fences built and being able to see as the fence was being built. So you boys came out on the right morning then to yes, see those bandies. You got Mulgaras too, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah Mulgaras. Yeah, we've one. seen Mulgaras now. The project, I feel, so far in the first five years has been an enormous success. When we released him, he just stayed put in the same spot. <laughs> <laughs> the program's working, the population is growing, and we're going to see those individuals expand out across the paddock. Mom, can you go that way? So we walked on this dune and we went that way. But we're not going to fence in all of Australia, and we're also not going to get rid of every predator in Australia. Cat detections at the grid and at the one-way gates suddenly just explodes in the last few yeah. months, so. Trying to get animals beyond fences is really like the holy grail of, of sort of threatened species conservation in, in Australia. So we have our two exclosures, the Thippa and Minku exclosures and the wild training zone bounded by the, the Queensland and South Australian border. There are a number of these safe havens around Australia, but what's different about ours is that we have this area we call the wild training zone. This large 100 square kilometre area is where we're training up our animals to live with low densities of cats and foxes. There was almost no cat and fox activity um, during 2020 at the, the grid or one-way gates. We need to equip them with the skills to live with cats and foxes in the landscape. Hopefully we can find ways to get our animals beyond the fences and back across the whole uh, Streslecki Desert and, and hopefully beyond. We all feel very hopeless with the extinction record in Australia, particularly of small mammals. And these types of projects really do give us an opportunity to feel hope where we otherwise wouldn't have any. We, we can return these animals to the environment, reverse the extinction trend, 
and these projects play a critical role in the delivery of that. It was really amazing. Last year, we had 100 millimetres in one rainfall event which actually filled some of the local water courses. Right, should we try out our boat? So suddenly we've got a lake and a white sandy beach just across from the house. I often experience mother guilt, which is where I uh, worry about whether I'm somehow disadvantaging my kids by being based so remotely. But I watch Isla and I think, wow, what a childhood. We've been here now uh, five years and Beck and I have signed another five-year contract which will take us through to the end of the 10-year funding agreement. But we really hope it's just the start for this, this area. Probably mouse tracks too. Yeah. Our extinction crisis is basically 30 seconds to midnight. And big projects like this show we can do it. When you sit in the wild deserts paddock late at night and you let a bandicoot go out of a bag, you think, oh yeah, I'm doing something. I've put something back that wasn't here. This species is now going to be surviving in this area because that's what we've done as a team and as a project. We're just custodians of the land and what's on the land. We won't be here for long, so it's important we leave them for our next generation here. Special visitor to play group today. He's in a bag inside at the moment. So this is one of the animals that we caught this morning in our traps. And this is a really special animal called a bilby. So this is a bilby. Oh, this is big long ears. Oh, look at him. Oh, wow. Look at this. Bilbies have really long ears to hear. What do bilbies eat? Mm, any ideas? Pizza. Pizza. I'm not sure that we have many pizzas at Wild Deserts, 